And we're back, folks. Um, I know there were a few questions in the Q&A box, and we will make sure that the panelists in the previous session get your questions and that they can be answered directly. So thank you for joining, joining us back after this short break. And our third and final segment is extremely important to all companies because we're going to be talking about perhaps their biggest asset, their employees, not just their current employees, but future workforce. And for that, I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague and talent initiatives manager at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, Michael Batt. Thanks, Judy. I appreciate it. So um, you can bring up the slides. That, uh, I'll walk through here briefly, but I have three speakers and I'm excited to, to have them share their perspectives and some of the testimonials because they come in from three different unique areas. Um, one is um, Ashley Hoffman. She's the Vice President for Marketing and Strategic Partnerships with a company called Brazen. They're headquartered right here in Northern Virginia and focus on virtual recruiting software. So tell me that's not going to be a hot topic for us to talk through. So I'll have uh, Ashley share some topics there. We have Andy Galloway from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. That's a multinational professional services and big four accounting firm. I asked Andy to come on and speak. He's a recent college grad, and I wanted him to share a story of, of graduating from college, coming and working for a, a great company here um, with offices in the Northern Virginia region, and what that experience has been like for him as a recent college grad. And then also, um, and, uh, Andrew Hootman, who's the Director for Market Operations and across Northern and Central Virginia for Aerotech. They're a a global recruiting and staffing leader and, and focus on workforce management. Um, so I think we've got three different unique perspectives here and hope you'll enjoy their conversations. We can go to the next slide. Um, what I want to do before I bring them on just to speak is make sure everyone's aware of the talent initiative program that we have launched here at Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. I'm the, the um, programs manager for this. It's, it's a, a multi-year investment by the county that we're excited. It couldn't be better timing for it to be launched at the beginning of our fiscal year. Um, and I wanted to, you know, this is all about, you know, attracting talent um, to our region. There are still a lot of high paying jobs here in the region, even uh, with COVID. So I want to just share a couple of, uh, of key points on this initiative, and then I'll, I'll uh, bring up Ashley. But so launched it in July, the beginning of our fiscal year with the charter of, like I said, bringing talent management to the area and making sure we promote the region, the entire region as a, a great place to live, work and play. And so the first thing we did is, is uh, brought on a marketing company that helps focus on workforce development for municipalities. So we're excited that we've awarded a contract and brought them on for a multi-year effort. We've launched a, a talent initiative website that I'll show here in a second. Um, that's all about, you know, live, work, play, continuing your education in the, in the region. Um, and then we're partnering with some, some different organizations on developing upscale programs and just continuing, continuing your education. A couple of examples of that are Northern Virginia Community College has partnered with Amazon Web Services and created a, a cloud associates degree program. Um, and they've just graduated that first class. And so we're excited to partner with them to help promote and help get those students uh, integrated into the workforce uh, here in Northern Virginia. Um, and then secondly, another example is there's a, a not-for-profit out of Tyson's called Skip International that's developing a program to meet the Department of Defense's new cybersecurity um, requirement that's going to launch at the end of this year. So that's going to have a great opportunity for um, veterans, people with clearances um, to get trained to meet those cybersecurity re requirements and help those companies around our region that focus on selling to the DOD um, audit and make those uh, meet those requirements or potentially join those companies. And then finally, um, uh, just on a highlight for some of the current initiatives for this program, we have contracted with Brazen, and Ashley will touch on, on again on Brazen here in a second, but we've contracted with Brazen Technologies to do two virtual career fairs to start with. Um, the first one is going to be uh, next week on the 28th, and that's going to be focused on college career graduates. So we're, we're excited. We have 10 companies lined up um, that are hiring right now. 
Um, and we'll have, we are, uh, we've reached out to the career offices from every one of the regional universities, I mean, even expanding out across the nation. Um, so, um, and we'll move on to the next virtual career fair that'll be in the late June timeframe, and that'll be more for seasoned career workers. So we wanna make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, because what's, what's really key on these initiatives and the virtual career fairs and a lot of what we have going on, even with COVID, Northern Virginia, you know, we're at the doorsteps of the largest procurer of products and services in the world with the federal government. There's still 35,000 open positions that are hiring at six figure high incomes out here right now. So we want to make sure that we're doing our part to help um, those companies fill those positions and help folks that are uh, looking for positions um, to fill those. If we can go to the, the next slide. So talent initiative website, I encourage you to go check this out. It's, you know, workinnorthernvirginia.com. This is based on an uh, initiative that, that uh, we uh, launched a, a number of months ago in partnership with um, all of the jurisdictions EDAs. It's really to um, promote the county um, as well as the region. So we're partnering with all the, the county um, economic development authorities. And this site is really meant to um, uh, promote the region and it's really it was built to promote the region for you our great companies um, in Northern Virginia it's, and so this is a great tool for you exploring you know the different communities to live in um, it has a cost of living calculator because again we're pulling in and promoting from across the region from across the US and across the, the globe um, we'll have uh, fe uh, uh, featured jobs um, promoted on there on a weekly basis the continuing education programs I touched on. And so there's a lot here that we want to make sure you, um, you seek and learn about. To include that uh, virtual career fair, we have that posted on there too, so you can get the details and promote and register for that upcoming virtual career fair next week. Um, so please provide your feedback to us. Let us know how we can help improve and, and uh, continue to develop this site because we built, it's built for you our companies um, here in the region. So let me shift gears now as um, I ask Ashley to uh, un, uh, unmute her phone and, and uh, come on live with her camera. I wanna uh, ask one quick poll question as we, we go to Ashley. And that question is, you know, how, you know, how did the hiring changes for your organizations change you know, during this pandemic? You know, have they changed? Um, here's a few different uh, scenarios. So we just wanna hear from you on you know, how, how this time has, has changed for your organization from a hiring standpoint. Well, we wait to let folks chime in and, and respond to this. Um, let, me, uh, let me just briefly go back and uh, introduce Ashley. So Ashley, what I'm gonna ask you to talk about is, is help us understand more about Braze and, um, and the virtual career fair solution that you offer. And then what we wanna hear from you on is, you know, what are you hearing from your clients? How are they adjusting to this new norm across the workforce? And so, um, as I, before I, if you can see the poll results here, it looks like there's no change for a lot of folks from 53%, which is, which is great. And that's what we're seeing, you know, across the board. Yes, there's been some reductions in, in hiring and internships and those type things, but the good news here um, in the Northern Virginia region, it's still, you know, there's still a, a really great opportunity for a career here. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Ashley, to, to share some of your input. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. You guys can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, so, so excited to be here. Appreciate the invite. Um, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with all of you today. I did answer the poll before I started talking. We are one of the companies that has had a hiring increase. I think in the past two months, we've hired, um, I'd say six to eight people, which you, we are a small business in, uh, in Arlington. Um, we're under 50 employees. I kind of compare us often to the Wizard of Oz. You know, our clients include a lot of the big companies here in the area, so Lidos and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, um, but yet we are, you know, we're a small shop. So we're kind of the wizard in some ways in that um, we, we swing big, but we are a pretty small and mighty team. Um, that said, given what we do and that our platform powers virtual events, as Michael mentioned, uh, it's been an unprecedented time for us, which is good. You know, I can't complain about being busy um, given other impact people have felt. Um, 
And even on the, you know, the hiring freeze side, uh, a lot of our clients are using the word pause versus freeze. Um, freeze can sound very uh, winterish and like, you know, frozen things take a long time to thaw. Um, and so it's been nice to hear that even companies that are not hiring right now or that have closed down their requisitions are really looking at it more as a pause and that they expect to restart pretty quickly. Um, so just a little bit about Brazen. Um, I've been at Brazen, it'll be nine years in June. So I was uh, employee number three, if you think about where we are now from a company, lots of small pivots and different people coming in and out in the very early days. But once we established that footing of, of who we are and what product we have, um, I've watched the company grow and been part of it from a team of three people, you know, sitting across from a CEO in a small room in Tyson's Corner, um, up to where we are now on Wilson Boulevard in Arlington with a team of about 50 and the clients I mentioned. So it's been a really exciting time to be there. So we are in the recruiting space uh, and we serve a couple different types of clients. We serve employers. We also serve universities. So a lot of maybe over a hundred or so universities are clients of Brazen. Um, they use our platform to host everything from online career fairs for their students to alumni networking sessions. Um, we also work with partners. So here in the area, there's a job board cl called clearjobs.net. Um, they help connect uh, engineers and other candidates that have a security clearance, which we know a lot of um, organizations in the area need with employers. And so we power all of the events that connect their audience with their employer base. So it's kind of three different areas and that's where, you know, Mike and his team are coming in. We are powering the virtual career fair that he's working on for um, first one being college students and employers in the area. So we're excited to help that go live. Um, it's, you know, it's been a interesting time just major impact from all businesses. You know, every day I'm confronted and talking to a business where I am exposed to like, wow, didn't know COVID would have that impact. Um, last week I talked with the national governing body of sororities and fraternities about thinking through how they're going to virtualize their recruitment on campus, you know, traditional Greek week, if you will. Um, that's kind of a funnier example in some ways, but you know, it's, there's, every business is having to think through how do they take what they do on site and take the engagement they do face to face and translate that quickly into online engagement. And so our platform facilitates that interaction mainly again in the recruiting context. So connecting employers with job seekers, although I also consider recruiting um, uh, campus recruitment. So recruiting uh, potential students to learn more about universities. So we work with even universities in the area who use our tool to power virtual online event experiences to learn more about a school and connect with a you know, counselor or admissions counselor who can chat about it. Um, I'd say if I think about you know, the hundreds of clients and prospective clients that are in those three areas that I've talked to over the past two months, a couple things do stand out that might be helpful just to um, you know, sum up for everyone here. I know you're all from maybe different types of businesses or different roles in the organization. Um, but you know, the, the three themes, I guess, that really stick out to me, um, one would be agility and just moving quickly. Um, so an example I have is Duke Health. They're one of our large healthcare clients. They're a new healthcare client. Um, they had a major uh, in-person nursing career fair planned for like right at the cusp of when we all knew how to say the word COVID a bit too well. Um, it was like March 12th. They had about 500 nurses signed up. They had rented the Duke basketball stadium, um, huge visibility. They had their you know, C-suite of nursing executives all planning to attend. And they had to make the call pretty quickly that it was no longer a safe or maybe a wise thing to do given how COVID was developing. So I think they called me on a Wednesday and by the following Friday, we had three different virtual events set up for them with 25 departments in there. And what I was impressed about was that their leader, the risk that she was willing to accept. Um, she knew that things were not gonna be perfect. Um, she knew that she was accept accepting some risk to move something so, you know, with a high visibility um, onto an online platform. But all of that was outweighed by the need for nurses and the, the, world they knew they were kind of heading into over the coming weeks beyond that date. And so they made that kind of call of, 
is it better to potentially have a total failure? Uh, maybe the platform goes down, which it obviously never would, but you know, they didn't know that. Maybe our candidates hate it. Maybe no experienced nurses sign up because they, you know, they won't be comfortable on an online tool. Maybe our hiring managers will hate us and we'll get a bad name internally for trying to put this on. So, you know, there were a lot of hesitations and fears out there, but the, you know, the promise of, but what if we could still make hundreds of hires for nurses? What if we could still offer a really good candidate experience? What if people loved it and we decided this was the way that we were going to do a lot of our recruiting events moving forward? That outweighed those hesitations. So I'd say, you know, calculated assessment of risk versus reward and then moving fast to get in that area. So the leader over there, the director of talent was able to really galvanize support from her team and just kind of let everyone know that we were comfortable with, with failure. We were comfortable with having this not work, but the effort was the, the potential reward on the other side was worth it regardless. So, you know, in the end, the Disney story is that it was a huge success. They've made over now 200 hires from the series of three events they did over two days. And at the end of the day, the, you know, Duke Health has the nurses to support what they're going through right now. And so they serve the community, they did it in a safe way, and they did it by kind of acknowledging some major risks that they were headed into. To, but that, you know, again, that reward was pretty high. Um, so that to me stood out as just a great example of a company balancing that risk versus reward and then moving fast, um, even though they couldn't remove all the doubts or hesitations they had in their mind. Um, another theme that I would say um, is, is something that I talk a lot about to my clients, which is it's a, you know, I don't have to say this, it's given, it's a different world. Um, moving something from an in-person engagement to online is different. And so I'm not super interested in trying to replicate everything a client does to get to their desired end goal when they move it from in-person to online. I work with my clients to have a collaborative discussion around you know, what is the end you're trying to get to? So if we go back to that Duke Health example, the end state is we have nurses in our hallways who've been hired. The means to get there are very different. So I might, I have some clients that call me and they're frantic or a new client and say, we got to figure out how to do this online. Here's how we do it. We first go in the hallway and then we have 15 different people we talk to and then we do this or that. And I, I totally get that need. I mean, it's, it takes some brain work to kind of rethink how to get there. But I would just encourage all of you, and even at our own company, we're encouraging ourselves to not think of how do we, how do we replicate the business as usual in a different way, but how do we do something in a different way to get to the same goal? And, and that alone, that little shift in thinking, I think can be really helpful because what happens is if you try to replicate everything, you end up missing out on some of the benefits that a new medium might bring to the table. Um, and you also fail to acknowledge maybe some components of the weaknesses in this new medium and how you're going to address them. Um, maybe if you can't fully replicate. Um, so I, you know, I think that's a good theme to remember is just, you know, focusing on the desired end state and, you know, not trying to look at how can we 100% replicate this, but how can we take advantage of a new medium and kind of put it in its own track and work within that track to make it the best they can be and, you know, play up the strengths of doing something online, play up some of the efficiencies, play up some of the cost savings. Um, for a lot of our clients, you know, even though if they're new, they're investing in a new tool with us, if they think about the dollars spent on some of the in-person events they do, it's a major cost savings for them. So also kind of retraining with your clients about if you're asking them to invest in something new, even in this time of some austerity, what is the overall cost savings when they compare it to how they used to do things or what they're replacing this for? Um, I think the, the final thing that I've talked with a lot of clients about, um, and I don't take credit for this, is actually Mark Cuban I saw on LinkedIn, um, and he said that, you know, how brands act, you know, how, what the, what they communicate that I'm sure we've all gotten letters from CEOs, from airlines that we're a part of, or um, different organizations, you know, how brands act today will define their brand for decades to come. 
And in our business, you know, working with employers and with job seekers, we're translating that into how you, you um, maintain your employer brand. So employer brand is just kind of the, the job seeker career side of a, a consumer brand. Um, so how you maintain your employer brand and how you maintain the candidate experience, whether they're an employee or a potential job seeker, is just as critical. You know, if a candidate gets a bad taste in their mouth, if they applied for a requisition, you've since had a hiring pause and they hear nothing, um, that will set a precedent for how they view your employer brand and the likelihood to apply to, to your company um, potentially for a decade to come. You know, it has a huge impact even on the consumer side. Um, the example we often give in our business is um, Disney has a, um, a, you know, value of every candidate that is not hired, they do a personal phone call with because they know that every candidate could also be a consumer. And that if they have a bad taste in their mouth for the candidate experience, are they less likely to want to spend lots of dollars taking their family to Disney World? And so we want to encourage our clients to think through that, whether it's a hiring pause, layoffs, um, you know, hiring increase to maintain your equity in the employer brand market. Um, a good example is um, we have a, another healthcare client down in Florida, but they're, they do have national footprint. They're called Advent Health. They're you know, a major healthcare system in the country and they are on a hiring pause yet they are still doing weekly, they call them Q and virtual Q and A chats with any candidate interested. They actually have a chat just called um, displaced by COVID-19. You know, obviously in Florida, they have a lot of candidates that are been displaced from hotel brands. And so they're maintaining that brand equity because they know that it's not a freeze, it is a pause, they will need to restart. And if they can make a positive, um, perception with candidates of who they are as a company and how they treat candidates that will pay dividends when they go back to hiring and going back to competing with those same hotels to hire a custodial worker, to hire um, someone to work in the cafeteria, all the way up to a nurse practitioner. Um, so I would just encourage everyone on here on the call today to think about that. I know it's challenging given all the added stress we're all going through, but um, employer brand is important. You spend a lot to um, get there. Um, and candidate experience is important. And even if you're on a hiring pause or you've done layoffs, don't sacrifice that. There are still ways to maintain that level of interaction you're having and maintain that good candidate experience, even if you're not actively hiring. And it will pay dividends when things um, you know, start to move forward faster. So uh, I usually don't like to talk that long, but that's it. Those are my th three things. That was great. Thanks, Ashley. I appreciate that. I, we have a few questions in the box. I think the first one, uh, I'll, I'll offer to you, and I think you answered some of it, and the second two will we'll hold for uh, Andrew at Aerotech, but you know, it's basically the question um, is asking about how you know, your organizations overcome or your clients have overcome organizations' complexity, you know, how your peers, vendors, clients have, you know, in the ecosystem have, um, have approached you know, the change. I know you touched on one with, you know, the agility of Duke Health. That was a great one, but I don't know if there's any others in just overcoming the organization's complexity. Um, you know, I think, um, I guess I, I'd, I'd interpret that a couple ways in terms of complexity and change. You know, we've had to be really flexible at Brazen. I'm sure many of the business owners here are going through the same thing where, you know, we've had some clients that have asked us to pause billing, extend payment terms. Um, you know, I think one thing that has helped is um, really approaching every engagement as a partnership. Um, you know, they are our client, yes. And so we want to make them happy, but having a conversation of, hey, we're also a small business and then we have our vendors that we have to pay and can we find a way to work together on this so that we can you know, have that happy medium between us. I think that's been really helpful and something I didn't initially do up front. You know, when a major Fortune 500 company asks if they can extend payment terms, I'm typically willing to say, okay. Um, but just, I think that making it a human conversation and acknowledging that you know, we too are a small business. We too have other um, responsibilities has been helpful regardless of a role that they have in the company or type of company. Um, just being genuine about your own limitations you have on your side. I don't know if that answered the question or not. 
or I think, well, I think that's great. I think we'll probably get some more perspectives here too in a minute. So Ashley, thank you very much. That was yeah, thank you. Thanks. So let me shift gears here and let's let's bring on um, Andrew um, Hootman again, who's with Aerotech. Um, he's the director of market operations um, in Northern Virginia and Central Virginia. Again, uh, you know, I think the perspective Andrew you'll have coming at it from you know, a recruiting, staffing, workforce management company. We, we, uh, we really want to hear from you on, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, Aerotech and, you know, how, how your team has changed um, and how you work and then how you're interacting with the clients um, based on, on COVID now. So thanks for joining us. Sure. Can you hear me, Mike? Yes, we can. And I just want to let you know, someone has blocked my video, so I can't, you can't see me every time I click on it. So I don't know if, there we go. Start my video. Perfect. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the time. First, Mike, thank you for getting this all set up. Um, I think this is a great thing you guys are doing for the community. And I just want to thank the Economic Council as a whole. I know I've interacted with a bunch of you guys over the past year. Um, but thank you very much for everyone's time this morning. Um, so as Mike alluded, my name is Andrew Hoopman. I am the Director of Market Operations for Aerotech. Um, if you're not familiar with our company, um, we are the world's largest staffing company. Um, our parent company is Allegis Group with uh, multiple subsidiaries underneath it. Some, some you might be familiar with uh, in the local areas, Tech Systems that does participate within this council as well, um, is one of our sister companies. Um, with Aerotech, we have over 250 offices here in the United States um, and employing just under 9,000 in internal employees across all different facets. and. Um, with our total book of business, we employ on a weekly basis and pay over 100,000 contractors in some way, shape, or form. Um, we've been in business since 1983, founded in Baltimore, and our headquarters are in just outside of Baltimore, Hanover, Maryland. Um, and like I said, I've been with the company for 13 years. Actually very unique for me because the first 12 uh, or 11 and a half years I spent in Columbus, Ohio, um, and then um, did move for this op opportunity here to Fairfax. So this council really has helped me out to understand the region, um, understand just key people to speak with and engage with. So it's been great to, over the last couple months, 12 months, just to really understand the industry better and become knowledgeable there. Um, so for us, you know, how we've adjusted, um, you know, it's been interesting for us as an organization because in the beginning of this year, we actually, without knowing anything that was going to go on in COVID, we split our company into three different business units. So, which the, with the intent of getting smaller to get better to get bigger, um, we split our company into three different facets of our engineering and sciences division business unit, our industrial business unit, and our professional uh, business unit. Um, and primarily, our focus is is we focus on working with clients. Um, and engaging with them on a contract and contract to hire some may be familiar with more of the temporary placement. Um, and then we also engage with some about, I'd say about 15 to 20% of our businesses on the direct placement where a company just wants an individual directly for us to source for them. And we do find that for them. So engage in a variety of different facets, but I specialize in our engineering and sciences division, as Mike alluded to, I oversee our operations here um, in uh, Fairfax, Winchester, Roanoke, and Richmond, um, specifically for the engineering sciences field. Um, in Mar when this all took place, we've been now work for home. This is our 10th week we're going into a work from home function. Um, and, and to be honest with you, when I was talking with Mike kind of preparing for this is, you know, it, it was one of those things that I, I just truly wasn't sure how it was gonna shape up, how my team was gonna react and how people were gonna be able to manage from afar. And my goodness, has it been a blessing for our team? Um, you know, people surprise you when they're put into situations um, to excel. And, you know, a lot of people have. And, and for us, what we've gone to is we're not using Zoom like this, but we've done a lot of stuff virtually over WebEx. And it's a taught us a different way to do the job. We have been doing the job a certain way for, you know, um, for the 37 years we've been in business, we've been doing the job a certain way. And now we've realized that, hey, maybe being in the office from eight to five every single day um, doesn't need to be a reality. A lot of people coming up in the workforce um, want the option and flexibility to work from home. So this has excelled us into um, that, that state of business. 
We also have been, we've had technologies that our company's invested pretty heavily in uh, within CRM platforms. And we were probably only utilizing it for a small portion of what it could be utilized for. And us working from home now, we've actually been able to get much more ingrained with our business partners, um, not only internally, but with our clients because we're utilizing the technology for what it's truly worth and everyone's utilizing the technology for what it's truly worth. Um, you know, as alluded to some themes that I think of for us is, you know, the first and foremost thing for me is empathy was the one theme that we had to look at. And it's leading with empathy, not only internally, but with our customers, because we deal with customers that are five people startup companies. And we're also dealing with the large companies like your Boeings, your Raytheons, um, your Northrop Grumman's and Lockheed Martin's. Um, so every single individual and every single company is handling this differently. Um, so it's just understanding and being able to meet people where they're at and not necessarily talking with about business all the time. Um, and just making sure people are okay um, and that their families are doing okay and that their companies are doing okay. Um, the second theme for me has been mindset. Um, it is very easy when you're in an account or you're in an environment where you need to be self-disciplined um, that you have to have the right mindset to do this job. I've been reading a lot of books recently and a lot of them have been around mindset and just different ways to approach mindset. And it's the, the growth versus the fixed mindset. And the one thing I've been focusing on with my team is getting out of the fixed mindset and getting more into the growth mindset of, hey, this is how we're going to do business moving forward. One theme that I've said around mindset for my team is we need to redefine what is possible. Um, and that's kind of stuck with us since we've been in not only this business unit shift for us, but with this COVID pan pandemic is we have to redefine how we're going to do business. And that, hey, saying this is the new normal and just being able to accept that has gone a long way with our team. And the last piece for us is leadership. For me as a leader, um, I oversee quite a few folks uh, from both sales and recruiting functions. And this has allowed people to step up and me for me to be able to delegate to them different responsibilities. And we've actually seen quite a bit of growth, not only personally and professionally for individuals, but in the overall operation, because I, I've come to the conclusion, I don't know everything and I'm not the smartest person in the room, but collectively now we've got a lot of brilliant minds speaking and thinking and taking action um, that in the past they might have sat back and waited for someone else to do it for them. So, We've seen a lot of positives coming out of this. We've also seen the kind of like to switch gears of like, hey, how have your customers adjusted? We've in the engineering and sciences business unit, we've had both a mixture of customers that have put stuff on pause, but a lot of our customers have continued to either hire or continue to employ their people because they have the option of working from home as well. We have seen a few things where customers are staying, keeping their doors open, just due to the nature of their work and being classified work they need to be in certain locations where it's secured. So the customers have kept their doors open, but adhering to the social distancing guidelines set out by the CDC. Um, we are seeing it was, you know, for the month of March, um, we saw a little bit of a pullback in hiring um, and a pause in hiring. But what we did was we shifted, what should we be focusing on? And for us, it may not have been placing that software engineer at a government integrator, but we looked at as how can we help our community? And how can we help these people get back to work? Prior to COVID in February, we were at unprecedented low in unemployment. I mean, some of the skill sets in this area, it was under 1% of unemployment. Now we're seeing record highs. So how do we get these people back to work? And one of the approaches we looked at is to keep not only the community safe and doors open for companies, we started placing medical screeners at companies on a contract basis where they're at the forefront, screening people before they're coming into office buildings or manufacturing facilities. A different way to redefine what's possible in changing our business mindset to helping our customers within the community. The other thing we did, and um, it was alluded to by our, our previous speaker, was we started talking, we started taking <clears throat> um, approach of, we're calling it our concierge approach, right? And what we're defining that mean is we are not, we're here to be a career uh, a career advisor for these individuals that we're recruiting. A lot of them have never been in the situation of being unemployed. So our job now is like it's always been, but it's more important now that we are taking what people's goals, skills, and interests are and marketing them directly to customers 
that may not have been hiring right this second, but showing them the access that they have now to talent that has not been on the market for the past couple of years. And as things are planning on, like things are opening back up right now, uh, our focus remains um, that we are going to, we are sticking by our customers. We are seeing our customers daily increase requirements that they're looking for us. In our market right now, we're focused on the, the we're seeing a bigger push in the larger companies. Um, and I think this would answer your question of the person that asked it um, is companies that we're hiring is we're seeing the larger company or the larger government integrators right now because of their programs are currently funded through 2020. Um, they need to still get work done because they owe a deliverable back to the government. So we're seeing an increase in hiring in there. And now the smaller businesses are starting to come back over the last couple of weeks. We anticipate in June, based on some forecasting, for even more businesses to open back up. And the great part about it is the people, they, if they had to unfortunately furlough them or lay them off, they're already contacting us to bring those individuals back. Um, so for us, we, may, we, we remain optimistic. We know we play a big role within getting the economy open back up in Northern Virginia. And what we're redefining what's possible every single day by shifting our business units to meet the needs of our customers and still while maintaining our internal employee, our internal employees and making sure everyone's safe and healthy there. So Mike, I, you know, I rambled on a little bit there, but I'll flip it back over to you. And I hope that did answer the questions that you were looking for us to answer. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think you helped answer the two questions we had in the, uh, in the queue. Um, you know, cause the first one was, was around, uh, are companies still hiring? You touched on that. The government contractors, the, the large technology companies, we're seeing them all hiring in large scale still. Nothing has changed for them. And then, you know, the new requirements, you know, that, that might've changed because of this new virtual world. I think you touched on those too, with, you know, empathy, growth mindset, leadership, um, so uh, I think uh, what you delivered and what you shared was was uh, was right on and greatly appreciated. So thanks, Andrew. Yeah, and thanks for the time, Mike, and uh, I do appreciate it. All right, thanks. Well, let's uh, let's close out here with one I thought would be fun for us, and then we'll we'll uh, shift to our our closing speaker to close out today's um, event. But but I thought it would be fun and interesting to have uh, Andy Galloway come on. If you put the camera on and come off mute, there he is. So. Um, I've known Andy for a long, long time, but um, I wanted Andy just to share a little bit about his background. Um, he's a lifelong Fairfax County resident, a recent college grad, and how he went about getting a new a job with an amazing company in Price Waterhouse Cooper is a multinational professional services company, big four accounting firm, and what that experience has been like for him because he's done all this since March. So it's a very interesting scenario. I thought it, 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 it's, it's, I think, uh, a positive story on how companies, people, everyone's adjusting and, and moving forward. So Andy, thanks for coming on and uh, just give us a little bit about your background and, and your experience and in, in where, you, where you went to school and your experience and how you just joined on to uh, PwC. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, everybody. Um, so yeah, as Mike said, I'm a lifelong um, Fairfax County resident. Um, I lived and rested my whole life pretty much. Um, I went to Herndon High School, graduated in the class of 2015. Um, after that, I went to Clemson University in South Carolina, and that was pretty much the best experience I could ever have had. Um, I, would, I had two different degrees. I had a degree in financial management as well as management with an emphasis in business analytics. I also had a minor in accounting. Um, and after I graduated, I kind of came back to the area my parents were nice enough to let me stay in their house. Um, as you can see behind me, I still have some, I'm still there. So uh, yeah, that's pretty nice. Um, so I actually, I did some local stuff uh, right after graduating. Uh, I worked on a campaign, uh, just kind of stayed around, the, stayed around the area. Um, I actually had a job, but it wasn't really for me. So um, probably around February or so, I started looking for a new job and um, after a bunch of applications sent out on Glassdoor and uh, Indeed and all the different websites, um, my LinkedIn actually uh, had my, um, I, I put in the, the feature that says like, oh, I'm looking for a new career. And I was lucky enough to be reached out to by PwC. And um, so this was in February, like right before everything kind of got really bad. So I took a couple phone interviews, took a couple tests, and they decided they wanted to have me in for a personal interview. So actually flew down to South Carolina right before the uh, 
pretty much everything, like all the airlines stopped flying and whatever else. So I got pretty lucky, um, had my phone in or had my in-person interview. I guess I did all right. Um, so they offered me a job around early March. And at this point, um, I had quit my other job. So I thought I had a whole month off and then I was going to start my new career and then everything kind of went crazy. Um, so yeah. So I thought I was going to have some time to relax and do whatever, uh, maybe watch some March Madness. And then as everyone knows, that just didn't happen. Um, so in this time, like they sent me an email saying that I would be onboarding. My first day would be in Atlanta. Um, and that first day, like, I guess they give you your, your computer and they talk to you about the company and they tell you what you're going to be doing or whatever else. And so I was looking forward to that. And then I realized like, this probably isn't going to happen. Um, I wouldn't be able to get a flight really. And like, they probably don't want a lot of people come, uh, meeting together like that. So I was getting a little nervous about that. And then one of my good friends, actually, he's another Clemson grad. Um, he's from Maryland and he, his job got, or he finally got an offer for a job. He'd been searching for about a year and that job offer got rescinded. And I was thinking, oh no, like that could happen to me. Like that would be terrible. So I started to get a little nervous. I actually emailed my recruiter asking like, Hey, like I haven't heard anything back. Like, am I going to be out of a job? And um, she said, no, no, like we, we are working on a way to make this work digitally. And uh, I really am, got lucky that I got such a great company that they could change everything become digital. Um, so anyway, they, they asked me for my email or for my, excuse me, my home address. I gave them my address and actually shipped me my computer as well as some login instructions. So I was able to log in to my computer before my first day and everything was looking good. Um, that first day was probably the only time I've ever been, I was a little nervous about like what was going to happen. Um, so I, got, I woke up at like seven or whatever, got ready, looked reasonably presentable. Um, start got on my computer at eight o'clock and I pulled up my work email and I pulled up my personal email on my personal computer. I was just sitting there looking like, what am I going to be doing? Because like they, I can't ask anybody for help. Like I don't know anybody. It's not like you go into the office the first day and you can talk to your neighbors or you can talk to your boss. I didn't have any contact information for anyone. So I was sitting there like, Oh no, this is bad. But probably around 9 a.m., I got like a couple of invites for like Google Hangouts and other video conferencing. And that's like when everything kind of switched. Like you can tell PwC was prepared for this. Um, they basically turned that onboarding process that was supposed to be in Atlanta. They made it all uh, virtual. And they did it in such a good way that like you got a chance to meet all the other people who were onboarding with you just as if you were doing it in person. While they didn't like, they didn't miss out on any of the information either. Um, they, so they had all that put it in like PowerPoint form and helped present it in a good way, um, as well as making themselves accessible. So if you needed to email them, ask questions, you were able to do that. I really appreciated that. Um, also towards the end of those presentations, they expressed that they have, they do like a buddy system as well as like a, men, like a mentor system. And I was thinking like, oh, that probably won't be that helpful. But then I realized like, if you need to ask questions or anything, like if you have a simple question, you typically could just ask your neighbor at work, like, oh, what, what are you doing now? And they would be able to help you out. But virtually, I mean, there's no one to ask. So my buddy actually reached out to me and uh, he was about my age. And he said, basically, um, I want to hop on a video conference and I can just talk to you about some about the company and help you like figure out what you're doing. And that was just so invaluable that I was able to, to be kind of face to face with someone, especially during this time and uh, get some help and really kind of figure out what I'm supposed to be doing, ask him any questions. And I really appreciated that. Uh, also, my my mentor reached out and basically talked to me about like, what I should be doing for projects as well as other things, uh, how onboarding, like the best, most um, effective way to get it all done as well as retain all the information. So I really appreciated that. And also um, the, the onboarding team was able to uh, let me meet all of my um, new coworkers, not all of them, but a good amount of them so that I could exchange phone numbers as well, so I could text them or I could Skype them or um, use Google Hangouts in order to reach out to them. And that's really important because like, if you think about it, like, the first couple of days at work, you try to make your friends. And it's, it's really hard to do that when you're virtual. Um, Cause again, I'm sitting in my parents' basement. And <laughs> so it makes it a little tough. Um, so after that, um, did we, they gave us like an onboarding list, went through all of that. Um, and I actually even started on a project. Um, we worked with a financial institution doing some COVID stuff. Um, I actually finished that about a week ago and actually was just assigned to a new project yesterday. So I'll be looking forward to seeing where everything else goes from here. 
That's great, Andy. Thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing your your onboarding journey. I think what you, what you've shared is just a great testament to the companies here that are adapting, as well as you as a recent college grad. So so that was it's good to hear that the companies in the area are still forging ahead. Didn't affect your your start date. So. Thank you for sharing with that. I really appreciate you coming on and doing that. Yeah. I think we have one um, live question um, we want to get asked, and then we're going to uh, close out the session. Thank you. Thanks. Is there a question that we have a live speaker? I think we have Catherine. There we go. Catherine, it looks like you might need to come off mute if you had a question. Maybe your phone is on mute, if you could check. Well, we might have to just have this one uh, typed in. So um, I, I wanna close out the session by thanking everybody for, uh, for participating today. I, we had three great speakers here. I'm going to turn it back over to Juhi to, uh, to introduce our closing speaker. So thank you. And thank you, Mike. It was really good to hear everyone's stories, especially Andy, you and your experience. That's, that's really great. And it's good to have that positive experience in your first job. So to sum it all up for us, I'd like to invite the Executive Vice President of Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, Mr. Alex Iams. Thank you, Julie. It's great to be here. I'm so impressed with the event today. It's really a testament to the quality and depth of Fairfax County business community that we we're able to do this um, and showcase the expertise that uh, we have here. Um, thank you to everyone who was involved, our, our speakers, and a uh, special thanks to our staff, to Julie and to Tinder for making this happen, and Mike and John for, for being moderators on, on the panel sessions today. Um, I think you know some of the things that I, that I took away is just that we are we are at a major pivot point in the way that we work, um, and the investments and the time that we're putting into what we're doing right now will really pay off in the long run for for our businesses, and it may actually serve to optimize how we work and how we communicate with each other, um, and translate into some long term positive shifts in in our business practices. A couple messages uh, from, from speakers in particular that I, that I took note of. Uh, Tom, I was listening to every word that you said about how uh, attorneys are changing the way that they work, and I'm, and I'm fascinated by that. Um, my sister has worked remotely as an attorney for the past six years, and she's really been the outcast at her firm. She was the first person in her firm to ever work remotely, um, and really the only one up until this point in time. And now, so she's gone from the outcast to being on the cutting edge and, and is getting all sorts of calls about how to, you know, how to work remotely. Um, and it's, so it's been an extraordinary time just in, in our own uh, uh, family circle talking about things like that with her. Um, Ashley, you know, you were spot on with what you said about what we're doing now and how it'll be remembered in defining our brands going forward and the things that everybody's doing to, to connect with their clients right now. Um, we're connecting in, in new ways and making every effort to help each other out. Um, and so I think that we're, we're making the most of, of what is otherwise a, a very difficult time for our entire country. And, and Andrew, um, I really, I, I heard what you said and I really agree that the key theme is, is adaptation and, and redefining what's possible. Um, it's actually kind of, kind of exciting and eye-opening uh, what we're able to do you know, uh, when, when we're, we're pressed um, to, to do things differently and reshape how we operate. So um, it, it is an exciting time in, in that way. Uh, I'd like to just close with some updates from EDA and the, and the number of ways that we've responded to the crisis. Uh, number one, first and foremost, connecting businesses with resources and other forms of assistance and how they're, how they're pivoting and adapting. Uh, we, we had done a survey, we reached out and, and connected with 300 businesses across the county. Um, 150 of them requested follow-up assistance, and so our BI managers have been uh, on the case and working with them on, on their needs, um, you know, uh, familiarizing them with the grant and loan programs offered 
at the, at the federal level um, and at the Fairfax County level. We've been doing a, a webinar series in, in addition to this great program with the NOVA EDA, which is a, a collaboration of 10 jurisdictions in Northern Virginia. It's actually a 12 part series. We're only through three parts. So if you haven't been participating, you can, um, you can check it out tomorrow at 2 p.m., our, uh, our next segment. And we'll have eight parts following on after that. And it's really meant to track with uh, the business experience the crisis. So we started off with the, the emergency kit, funding and financing, um, staffing, and doing what's best for your organization and your team. And now we're getting into uh, some of the things that were actually covered today about you know, adapting your business to the digital environment and planning for, for future growth. Um, so I encourage you to check that out if, if you haven't already. And uh, the, the past sessions are inventoried on our website and can be accessed there. Another major important thing we're doing right now is connecting people with jobs. Uh, we have our, we've stood up our talent website. Uh, we're, we're making sure that there are opportunities for people who are out of work to get connected with employers who are hiring. We're doing really special things like uh, a virtual job fair coming up on May 28th. We have 11 companies participating. This one is uh, aimed at recent college graduates and current college students. So um, we encourage you to uh, uh, tune in and, and see, what all that, see what that's all about and uh, push it out to your networks. And you, you, you may know people who, who might be interested in an event like this. And lastly, of course, we're collaborating across the region um, and with our county officials on recovery strategies like the Connected DMV Strategic Renewal Task Force um, and everything that Fairfax County is putting forward to ensure that business lands on its feet when, when this is all over. My closing thought is a message of, of optimism for everyone. Um, Fairfax County and Northern Virginia are well positioned to recover from a, a downturn like this, a crisis like this, and we will be stronger and more resilient in the long term a, as a result. Uh, we have a diverse business base, 11 Fortune 500 company headquarters, professional service base, IT, government contractors, data centers, you name it. Um, not, not, not even mentioning the skilled workforce that we have um, and, the, and the types of technologies that our companies develop. For more information about any of this, anything that I mentioned, uh, the event today, please visit our website at fairfaxcountyeda.org. And I wish all of you uh, the best with running your businesses and working with your people and continuing to, to push through this. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that positive message as uh, we leave the program. And um, like Alex said, you can contact us at any time. You will see a slide up shortly that has our website address as well as email and phone number. We are here for our businesses. We are happy to help in whatever way we can. Well, thank you to the audience. You've been a wonderful audience. We had about 100 people logged in at every time. Just a quick reminder to please fill out the short survey that you see pop up as you leave the Zoom conference. And we look forward to our next event like this. Thank you very much. And bye from Juhi Nathani in Tyson's.